one of my favorite songs. I could listen to that anytime. Great song. Thank you, worship team, for coming and ministering to us. All right, we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So uh, hopefully you haven't lost your place in your Bible. We're asking this question this morning, where is God when it hurts? We are working through, this is week four, if you're tracking. And so week four is the final week. And then next week, we'll start that series on one another. In. All right, so the first week we went to Genesis chapter three. We looked at why we're in this position. And we said, well, really, it's because we have decided to reject God's best and accept what would be the worst. And so we have specific uh, struggles because of specific sins, but generally we struggle because we have decided to do what we wanted to do instead of obey God and following his word. Then the second week, we looked at John chapter 9, and we looked at the purpose of pain. Why do we have pain with the man that was born blind? And then we looked at why we have pain, and we saw and we talked about God working in our lives, God's compassion and care. We're going to come back to that today in a little bit. We looked at God's proven power, and then ultimately pain can help lead people to others, others to Christ. And we said, I said, and I don't know if it's you that feel this way. I do. I'd certainly like to lead someone to Christ without pain involved. But oftentimes when people are struggling and they're in pain and they are suffering, then they are more willing to lean in and to have that discussion about God and Christ and what he did. Last week, we asked this question, how do I stop sinking? And we looked at the woman that had the cause that was bleeding. And she had spent all of her money, and she came to the end of herself, and she reached out and just grabbed the tassel of Jesus' garment. And we talked about how do we stop sinking when we are in pain, because often when we have struggles, physically at least, to mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially, and then life just kind of sucks us down, and we don't know how to stop. So we talked about how to stop sinking. All right, so that's where we've been. Uh, this morning, I struggled with an opener because uh, I had two different slides I wanted to show. So I went with a more uh, traditional or conservative slide to not bring offense to people uh, and maybe not to bring offense to others. So I want to talk about prosperity gospel. Pe pe preachers that talk about the prosperity gospel. And maybe some, some of you are looking at me and smiling because you probably know who I would want to show. So instead of calling out certain people... I'm using this comic because we hear these people that preach, and all you need to do is trust Jesus. And they won't say Jesus the normal way. They'll say, just trust in Jesus. Did you ever hear those people? You ever listen to them? No, don't listen to them. You fell into my trap. All right? Do you have people, just trust in Jesus, and everything will be okay. And it will be more okay if you'd give me some seed money. And we have these people that preach this gospel, that tell you all these things, that say it's going to be okay, life is going to be fine if you simply just trust in the Lord and all of your cares will go away. Have you heard that before? Well, if you have, I'm sorry that you have, because that's not really reflective of what's in Scripture. So we're going to meet a man today that's going to help us learn about how to deal with pain. So if you're looking for a sermon title this morning, I'm calling this one, How Do I Cope With the Pain? Because we all have pain. We all have problems. We all have struggles. And it's not going to get any better. No matter how much money you give, you're going to continue to have pain and you're going to continue to have struggles. So the question I'm coming into the text this morning with is how do I deal with with the pain? How do I cope with the pain? I'm in 2 Corinthians. I'm in a topical study, which means I want to catch you up on what's going on in 2 Corinthians because I'm coming into this passage and I'm leaving it today. I'm not going to be in here next week. So really, 2 Corinthians, Paul is defending his apostleship. People are saying, Paul, why don't you tell us why you should be the one to tell us? You have to defend yourself. And Paul is calling out those false believers in 2 Corinthians and the false teachers because they're teaching a gospel that is not centered on the work of Christ. Really, Paul is dealing with prosperity gospel preachers and teachers. So he wants to make sure that he tells them what they need to look for and what true ministry looks like. I'm going to get into the immediate context in a minute when I hit verse 7. So 
Here we come. How do I cope with pain? Because we all have pain. Whether you have it now, or whether you took some pain medication and you don't feel it, or maybe in a little bit you're going to be coming into pain. It's one of those graphs that you see. We're either in coming into a struggle, we're in the middle of it, or we're coming out of it. You're coming into pain, you're in the middle of pain, or you're coming out of pain. So this is a, a universal message for everyone this morning. Verse 7, if you want to take notes this morning, is you need a humble reminder. You need to have a humble reminder, and Paul is going to give us this humble reminder in verse 7. All right, let's look at it. Paul says, and lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations. All right, let's just stop right there. I'm going to give you the immediate context. Let's look at the first six verses of first of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, because we read this, and I'm coming in, and I'm in the middle of his train of thought. And really, if I be honest, I'm in the middle of his train of thought, even with chapter 12, verse 1. So I'm going to go back even further a little bit later in the message and get chapter 11. But let's go ahead and see what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. I'm going to tell you about it. You can read it this afternoon if you so desire. Paul is talking about he doesn't want to boast, but his people are saying, we need you to boast. So Paul says, he says, I have known Christ 14 years ago, 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I don't know, or whether out of the body, I do not know. What I do know is that God caught one up to the third heaven. Paul is talking about in the, himself in the third person. Paul was taken to heaven. And he says, I don't know if I was taken to heaven in the body or in the spirit, in the flesh, in the mind. He goes, I don't know. But here's what I do know is I went to heaven. And he says, when I went to heaven, I don't know how I went there. He says, but I, uh, verse 3, I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. He was caught up into the paradise, verse 4. And he heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. So I went to heaven. I don't know if I went there in body, if I went there in soul or spirit or mind. He says, but I went there and I saw such a wonderful and amazing things that I'm not able to talk about them or speak of them. In myself, I'm not allowed. But they are so wonderful. And that's the immediate context that Paul is talking about. So he says, because I had this great abundance of revelations, because there was a great time that I was able to be taken to heaven. Friends, this is a great thing for us to remind ourselves of. Paul has a, an opportunity to boast. And he's, he could boast about, I got to go to heaven. Sometimes we find different things to boast about. Sometimes we boast about a new vehicle. We boast about a new house. We boast about a new job. We boast about our kids, our grandkids, our great-grandkids. We find many things that we boast about. And Paul says, hey, if I wanted to boast, if I wanted to make myself look proud and make myself look important, it would be the fact that I got to go to heaven. And I saw things that were so wonderful, so amazing, I can't even tell you. Now, Paul's sitting here going, would that make him look proud? Sure it would. Would that make him feel uh, uplifted? Sure it would. So he's saying, because I've had this abundance of revelation, because of the first six chapters, because I got to go to heaven, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. This idea of thorn, I did a lot of study on this, and I looked up the Greek word for thorn, and the Greek word for thorn is Translated a different way, not thorn. It's translated a stake. So when I think of thorn, I think of when I got holly roses, and sometimes I dethorn them, and sometimes Rocky or Mr. Sam Walton, he dethorns them for me. But sometimes I go and I get them, and one time I poke myself with a thorn. And I poke myself with the thorn. You know what I did? I said, ouch, and I took care of it. But this is not what Paul is saying. This isn't a little ouch. This is a stake that is in his body, a stake that they would use for crucifixion. So this isn't just a cute little thorn that's on a rose. This is a massive piece of wood that is into him. And so this isn't just a cute little, oh, I got stuck by a thorn and I got holly a rose. This is, I have extreme pain. I have extreme discomfort, and it's in my flesh. Now, commentators, again, I, I keep saying this the last couple of weeks, commentators, we buy, I buy their books because I want them to be able to help me find the answers. 
Do you know what Paul's thorn in the flesh was? We don't know. We don't know. But you can't buy a book and pay some odd dollars, 30, 50, 60, 100 dollars for a commentator and have him write, I don't know. Because if they do, would do that, I'd write a book and say, I don't know, and I'd get lots of money, wouldn't you? But commentators, they have a couple different thoughts of this. I'm going to tell you what they think, and I'm going to tell you my opinion. That and 25 cents will buy you nothing, but I, I do have an opinion, and I think it might be right. Some commentators think that there was a chronic illness wrong with Paul, something of physical defor deformity or something along the lines of gout or some kind of a form along the lines of something physical that would inhibit his ability to work. Some think he struggled with depression, that he was very depressed. Some think that it was demonic oppression, that he was oppressed by demons because of all the work that he was doing. And some of people, some commentators think that it was because of ministry, that this story of the flesh, it was ministry, that he had such a burden and such a heartache for ministry that it was bringing him physical discomfort. I'll get to that in about 15 minutes. If I forget, somebody remind me. I think with most commentators, and they're much more smart, much smarter than I am, but they say that they actually believe that it was a thorn in his side, actually a stake. And most commentators, if you make them really think about it and say, what do you think it is? Most commentators, uh, almost everyone I wrote, I read, excuse me, I don't write commentaries, I just try to read them. They said they believe it was his eyesight. Because when he was converted in Acts chapter 9, remember he was blind for three days. And so commentators think that he had poor eyesight. I think it's in Galatians 4 or Galatians 3. He talks about his eyes being poorly. But we don't know. And we don't know. But that's not the purpose of the passage. And I, give, I want to give a little bit of opinion as to why I think Paul doesn't tell us what it is. First of all, it's because it's not the purpose of the passage. But second of all, if Paul told us, I have bad eyes. I have macular degeneration of my eyes. Or I have gout in my flesh. We, when we have that problem, we would begin to boast in what we have wrong with us. Well, I'm just like Paul. And we become fixated and we start to idolize Paul. So Paul, he doesn't tell us what it is. Second of all, Bible scholars this afternoon, last thing I'm going to move on. Paul ministered in Corinth for 18 months according to Acts 18. They knew what this was. They saw him. They saw his, his struggle with it. So he didn't have to name it to them. He knew, they knew what he struggled with. It'd be like me leaving and then writing a letter to you saying, hey, remember when I talked to you about my problem? You would know what my problem is because I would talk about it. I ministered. You saw me in my struggle with it. That's what Paul's saying, okay? Long way to say he's got a thorn in his flesh. Something that's bothering him that's going to keep him humble. And it was given to him as a messenger of Satan. Look at how Paul looks at this. He has two different ways of looking at this. This is a messenger that is given to him from Satan. Why would Satan want to do this to him? Because it's going to discourage him. And that's the devil's job. That's the devil's order. That's his heart is to stop the movement of the church. Because if he can discourage you and have you focused on something else, then you're not focused on the prize of Christ, and you're focused on your own circumstances. Look at what Paul is doing. He is planting churches. He is preaching the word of God, and people are coming to know Christ in a very special way, in many, many ways, and that makes the devil angry. So the devil is trying to distract him with this thorn in the flesh. I would take you to Job chapter 1. Satan is not stronger than God, but God allowed this. All right, so, so Paul says, I have this thorn in the flesh, and it was given to me from Satan to discourage me, to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. So Paul's looking at this one, both ways. He's looking at this saying, I have a problem. I have pain. I have suffering. I can look at this and become discouraged, or I can look at this and say, God is keeping me humble. Because Paul is just as much of a man as I am. He puts his pants on one leg at a time, just like you and I do. And so Paul, even though he's been taken to heaven, he is reminded daily that he is a sinner in need of grace. And he has experienced God's great revelation. But it is a humble reminder that even though he's doing all this for the Lord, that 
that God wants him to not become bigger than himself. But he doesn't want him to become boastful in what he's able to do. All right, so let's go on to verse 8. But verse 8 is going to tell us that we're going to draw closer to the Lord. All right, verse 8, we're going to draw closer to the Lord. Concerning this thing, what's this thing, this form, concerning this stake that I have, this method of pain, physical pain, some of you understand what physical pain, you wake up with physical pain every single day. Concerning this pain, I pleaded with the Lord three times. Can I write a different translation? If I'm going to write a Bible study, a Bible uh, passage, I'm going to change this differently. Concerning this thing, I prayed to God. Paul is praying to the Lord. And some of you have physical problems. And you continue to pray, and you pray, and you pray, and you pray, and God does not hear. Are you with me? That's what Paul is going through. But I would like to change that perspective this morning. Paul says, this thing I pleaded with you to the Lord three times. God, I asked it three times that it might depart from me. God, would you stop this pain that I am enduring? I have prayed that prayer. I would be bold enough to say every single one of you has prayed that prayer if you're over the age of 20. Because after 20, people tell me things just go downhill from there. All right? So if you're over a certain age, you have aged, you have pain, you have difficulty, and you pray. Now, some people are saying, I prayed to God, and he hasn't heard me. That's not true. God hears our prayers. He doesn't always answer the way we think he should answer. You see the difference in that? I pray, and I get a no, therefore, I equate that with God does not hear me. That's not what Paul's saying. He says, I heard and I prayed three times. So if you want to, and if you can, I'm going to stretch this a little bit this morning. I, I believe it's within the bounds of Scripture that Paul prayed, and he had unanswered prayers. And so it gives me comfort that here I am, little old me, and I'm not looking for compliments that after the when we, if we do a line or in an email. Oh, you're not so little. You're important. All that. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Here comes Paul. He got up to the third heaven. He was an apostle. God himself spoke to Paul, and Paul had unanswered prayers. So if you're struggling with, say, with a thing and saying, I am struggling with unanswered prayers, you're in good company because Paul prayed. He prayed three times. This word pleaded is, is in my humble estimation, a bad translation. He begged the Lord. He cried out to the Lord. He was on his face. He wasn't kind of, hey, God, if you're not too busy, would you kind of sort of? He is throwing himself on the floor saying, God, take this from me. And God heard his prayer, but God said no. God said no. One commentator put it this way. He said, Paul is asking for a substitute for the thorn. And they really want to. Paul is asking for a substitute for the pain. He wants pleasure. I don't want a pain any more than you want pain. You don't want pain any more than I want pain. And we pray against this. We pray against pain for pleasure. Commentator says, God heard Paul's prayer. And he gave Paul a transformational perspective to look at. God's grace while suffering. God did not take away this thorn in the flesh. Whether it was eyes, whether it was gout, whether it was something else, God said no. And it hurts when God says no. We can all remember when we were kids and we went to our parents and we, can I do this? And mom and dad said no. And we get upset and we leave frustrated. But God is helping Paul change his perspective. He's having him with a transformation of perspective. And that's what I hope the rest of this message will help us do with pain that we have a transformation of perspective. All right, so verse three, uh, the third section, number verse 9, is how do I cope with pain? It's a reminder that I am human. No matter how much God uses me, I'm going to suffer. When I need to draw closer to the Lord, one thing I do want to talk about before I go to verse 8, let me go back and get this, is concerning this, this pain. What does Paul do? Paul gets closer to the Lord. 
When he has pain, what's he do? He prays to the Lord. Oftentimes, when we have pain, we get angry. And we ask this question, what did I do to deserve this? And we we treat from the Lord. We don't ask God why. We get angry with God, and we alienate the Lord. Look at what Paul does. He has pain. This pain is something that he cannot take care of himself. Yes, there is not medical technologies that we have now, but he cannot do anything about this pain. So he draws himself closer to the Lord. And how often, when we have something and we come into contact with something, friends, that we cannot control, we get angry with God. And we walk away from God. We retreat from God. Paul, he takes this and he pleads with the Lord. He prays to the Lord. And isn't it, without a show of hands, it's a rhetorical question. How many, how often is your prayer life when things are going well? How often do you pray when things are going well? How often do you pray when you have a thorn that you can't pray about, that you can't handle, that you need to pray about? I would dare say that we pray a whole lot more when we have trials and struggles and temptations we cannot handle. But there are some that just alienate the Lord. So the second thing is we want to draw close to the Lord, okay? Third thing is we need to allow God to work, right? Because when God begins to work in our life, we need to allow him to work. And God said, so he said to me, so Paul's writing this, so I'm going to clarify this just so we understand. So he, being God, said to me, being Paul. So I'm going to read it that way. So God said to Paul, and this is his response. God, I need you to take away this thorn in my flesh. Look at verse 8. Really quick. This is Paul's prayer. Concerning this thing, I pleaded from the Lord three times. God, this is my prayer. Would you take it away? God's response is this. My grace is sufficient for you. Oftentimes, we want yes. And oftentimes, friends, we want God to work quicker than we even pray. Because we do know that God is sovereign. We do know that God is an all-powerful God. But God, he could have taken this away, right? He could have. But he says, I don't want to. Because my grace is sufficient for you. One commentator commentated this way. He says, human weakness provides the ideal opportunity for the display of divine power. Human weakness provides ideal opportunity for the display of divine power. Friends, sometimes people get so focused on us. Hey, look at what Tom's doing. Look at what this person's doing. Look, look at what Kevin does. Look at what Christine does. And we get so focused on the person that we forget about the God that gave that person that power. And oftentimes, human weakness proves the ideal opportunity for the display of divine power because our goal should not be to bring glory to ourselves. Our goal should be to bring glory to God who gave us that gift. So he says, my grace is sufficient for you. No, Paul, I'm not going to take this thing from you. I'm not going to take this thorn. I'm not going to take this stake out of your body that's causing you physical discomfort. It's causing you depression. It's causing you anxiety. No, I don't want to hear no. I'm almost, I'm 39. I still don't like to hear no, especially when it comes from God. But God says, Paul, no to your request, but my grace is sufficient for you. I will give you what you need. A great cross reference for this would be Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. There is a peace that passes all understanding for those that are going through difficult times. And I've said this before, I said this in the message in John chapter 9, that when you go through difficult trials, there is a special peace that the Lord can deliver to you when you go through that difficult time. And if I'd be bold enough and you would be willing, I'd sit down and I'd say, who's going to be the first one to talk about a special measure of grace? Not to promote yourself, but to promote how God has ministered to you when he said, no, but my grace is sufficient for you. I would dare say there'd be some of you that would stand up and say, this is how God ministered to me. This is a peace that passes all understanding. 
And I'm going to be very careful. I'm going to step very gingerly out on this because I didn't get it clear. The one person I think of that has this understanding that your grace is sufficient for you is how Randy is handling his cancer. And I don't want to promote Randy. I don't want to showcase Randy. I don't want to do that, but hear my words. He is suffering, but he is suffering well. He is able to say, I want the cancer gone. I don't think he wants cancer, but he is able to say, my grace is sufficient for you. And God has a ministry to Randy that he can stand up here for hours, days, weeks, even years, and still not to be able to communicate how God has ministered peace to him because of Randy's faith and trust and hope. Randy wants it gone. Don wants it gone. Beloved, we want it gone. But God has a ministry to Randy through Philippians 4, 7, and then the grace that is sufficient for Randy to do it. That's one of one I know. And I'm looking around, and I know some of your stories. I don't know them all. But a lot of you can stand up and say, God's grace was sufficient for me. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Here comes Paul. Paul is a giant of the faith. He is an apostle. He's planting churches. He's, he's leading people to Christ, and he's got this weakness. And people are going to him going, how can you do this? And Paul is standing up going, don't look at me. I'm weak. Remember what's the purpose of 2 Corinthians, the whole book? Because they're saying, Paul, brag about yourself. And Paul's saying, if I'm going to brag about anything, I'm going to brag about how weak I am. Because it's in that my strength is made perfect in my weakness. Because all work done through me is not done by me, it's done by the Lord. And how often we stand up and we do things for God, and we say, you know what, I'm doing this for God. But Paul's saying, look at me. You know how weak I am. I've got this stink in me that is hurting me. And yet God is able to minister through me and to me because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. God says, I am glorified by what you're going through. And I'm the first one to stand up and say, God, can't you get your glory some other way? But yet God is able to say, in my strength, I am glorified. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I showed you this first quote. Commentator said it this way. He says, when believers are out of answers, confidence and strength, with nowhere else to turn but to God, then they are in the position to be most effective. Friends, whenever we come to the end of ourself, it's almost like our true ministry actually begins because we stop doing it in our own strength. And we start relying upon the Lord. Can I tell you what has happened in the last four weeks? Did you catch it? I don't know if you caught it. I caught it, but I caught it after about a week of pondering and prayer. About three months ago, we started looking at the school. And the school was not doing well as far as number-wise. I think we were 10 or 11, give or take, right in there. You know our, our, magic, our magic number to break even is 20. So we had this idea, Kevin and I had this idea, and I'm not throwing Kevin under the bus, you hear me? I'm not throwing you under the bus. But what we tried to do was, how can we get more interest into the school? So we had Joey make this great video, and he did a great job. And we put this out on Facebook, and it got shared, I want to say, 1,200 times, give or take. And it got shared and shared and shared, and we paid to have advertising and the 04943 zip code so that anyone that was on Facebook in a certain area of this church would get that on their feed, whether they wanted it or not. We, we force-fed them the school so that people would know so that they would come to the school and the school could survive. That's where we were at in the beginning of August. And you know how many people came because of that video? And then this little thing, hear me on this, called COVID came. And then COVID, we're still sitting there going, the school's going to shut down. Maybe it's just me. Maybe this is a little too much honesty of where I'm sitting from my chair going, we have 10 kids, COVID hit, everyone's in panic, the economy crashed, school's going to shut down after 40 years and all this. And then all of a sudden, we had one parent come and say, hey, can I talk to you about the school? And then guess what happened? That parent talked to that parent, that parent talked to that parent, that parent talked to that parent, that parent talked to that parent. And now tomorrow morning, we're going to have 24 kids in our school. And it wasn't over a single thing that we did. Kevin asks them, 
He says, how did you find out about us? Oh, well, Sally and Joe told me. Well, how'd you find out? Well, that, that person, Adam and Eve told me. Well, how'd you find out? Well, Jonah told me. And all this work that we did in our own human effort got us zero students. And then God stepped in. And he said, I'll provide you with students when you come to the end of all that you've done. Almost uh, God sitting in heaven going, you done with you yet? Because I'm ready to step in when you're ready to give over control. And that was something that happened. And I sat back and I went, wow. Okay, God, I, I think I understand. And I think God sat in heaven. Are you sure? Because I can teach you again. No, God, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. But when we come out of answers and we come out of confidence and we're out of strength with nowhere else to turn, then we go, okay, God, I've tried it all. Would you step in and help me? And God's finally saying, yes. Finally, you've come to him yourself. No one in the kingdom of God is too weak to experience God's power. Nobody's too weak to experience God's power. But many are too confident in their own strength. God, I'll call you when I'm ready to call you. I, I want to do this in my own power. And Paul's sitting there going, God, I can't do this because of this thorn in my flesh. I need you because I don't have the strength. Verse 9. He says, Therefore I will most gladly boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ. Great word picture. I'm going to take you back to the tabernacle, the Old Testament. When the, when the power of God, when God's presence was over the tabernacle, people knew that God was there. He was there either by the cloud or by fire. We just talked about that all, all through the spring. And this idea of Christ having the power, the power of Christ is a picture of God's power, of Christ's power, Resting on the person that is suffering. So if you're suffering, I don't want to stretch this too far out, but if you're suffering, God's power, Christ's power is resting on you so that in your weakness, you can become strong. What a great word picture to remember. All right, final thing. Final thing. How do I cope with pain? First thing is I need to have it to a humble reminder. I need to draw closer to the Lord. I need to pray my way through it. Draw closer to him. Don't alienate myself. I need to allow God to work. He's got something he wants to do in and through me when I come to the end of myself and begin to rely upon him. And then finally, I need to renew my strength. Right, let's look at verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmity and in reproaches and needs and persecutions and distress. Remember, I told you I'm jumping halfway in. I want to take you back to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 because this is one letter they would have gotten at one time. Really quick, I'm going to kick it into youth pastor mode to get your quick ears on. Paul has already talked about all the things that he's suffering. Let me tell you, why is he suffering? He's suffering infirmities, reproaches, needs, persecutions, distresses. For what purpose? For the sake of Christ, because Christ called him to it. What did Paul suffer? Go back with me to first, Second Corinthians, excuse me. Second Corinthians chapter 11, one chapter back, Paul just tells him all that happened because he is an apostle. He says, five times I received 40 lashes minus one. That is how many lashes? Okay, hey Jasmine, we need a math lesson. Okay, 49 minus, uh, 39, 49, 40 minus 1 is 39. 39 times he was whipped. All right, so I received 40 lashes minus 1 from the Jews. Five times. So I did quick math. Four, 40 times 5 is 200, minus 5 is 195. Is my math right? Because I've been helping Sarah with her math, so I'm not sure if that's good or bad. All right. So 195 times he has been lashed, whipped. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received stoning. And remember, this isn't stoning like we know now where they picked up stones and they threw at him. Not little chunks of gravel that are in your driveway. Honking peaks of granite to kill him. He was stoned and he was left for dead. Three times I was shipwrecked. I have spent a night and a day in the open sea. On frequent journeys, I face dangers from rivers, robbers, and my own people. Dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers among false brethren. Toil and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst. Now, some of you are getting hungry because it's snack time. Not hunger like you're facing right now. I'm talking there's no food, and he has not eaten for days. That's what he has faced. And thirst. Often without food, cold, and without clothing. Not enough to keep him warm. All that, 
that he faced physically. So 24 through 27 are all the physical things he faced. And then he faced some emotional part. Remember I said back in the beginning, commentators are, are thinking it might be emotional or mental stuff. He says in verse 28, not to mention other things. These are all just the physical. There's other things I, I suffer with. There is the daily pressure on me for my concern for all the churches. He has emotional angst because these churches are not following in the ways that he taught them. So he says, I have all these pressures on me physically. I have all these pressures on me emotionally and mentally and spiritually. So then he comes back in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. He says, yeah, I, don't, I take pleasures in my infirmities. He, he laid them out the previous chapter. In my reproaches, in my needs, in my persecution. Why? I did it for Christ. I did it for Christ. And I faced all this because of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And sometimes we try to be really strong and really macho so that we show everybody how well we're doing. But in my weakness, then Christ is shown through me. Final quote. Believers need to embrace the trials God allows them to undergo. I don't want this any more than you do. I'm not saying I have it covered because I don't. But he says believers need to embrace the trials God allows them to undergo, knowing that these trials reveal character, draw them closer to God, and how God shows his grace in their lives. And oftentimes, friends, when we go through the deepest, darkest valleys, it is through those valleys that we have a new understanding, a fresh understanding of God's grace. Because we come, finally come and say, I surrender all. God, you step in and you take the lead because I cannot do it on my own. How do I cope with the pain? It's a reminder that we're all human. If we need to draw close to the Lord, we need to allow God to work and then we need to renew our strength. You know what your application is? Which one are you okay with? Which one are you saying, I, I get this? And then which one is the struggle for you? Because we all have pain. We all have sorrow. We sang it this morning. Everybody has trials. Everybody has temptations. We sang it. You sang it. How do I cope with the pain? Four ways that we can cope with the pain. Let's close in a word of prayer. As your pastor, I'd love to pray for you. This is one of the sweetest times I have with you because this is how I know God is working in your life and how I can pray for you privately without anyone else knowing. Is there anyone here this morning that would say to me, would you pray for me because I am in pain or I am suffering, but I need to be, re this is a good reminder. Pray that I would remember that I need to be humble. Would you pray for me that way? I see that. Thank you. Anybody else? Is there anybody here this morning says, would you pray for me that during this pain I would draw closer to the Lord and not further away from him? Would you pray for me? Is there anybody here this I see that one hand. Thank you. I see that hand. Is there anybody here this morning that says, would you pray for me during the pain so that I can allow God to work in my life because there's things he needs to do? Is there anybody here this morning? Is there anybody here this morning that says, would you pray for me during the pain that I would renew my strength, that I would renew my trust in the Lord during this time of difficulty? Anybody? Lord, I'm so thankful for this passage. I'm thankful for Paul. Lord, we covered a lot of territory this morning, from unanswered prayers to answered prayers in a different way. And Lord, we learned this morning how we cope with pain. Lord, I pray for that one that raised their hand, that they would have a reminder and that reminder would be that your strength and your grace is sufficient for them. Lord, we have this reminder that we all face trials. And we all face temptations. Lord, I pray for that one that wants to draw closer to you during their pain and during their sorrow and heartache. I pray that, that they would draw close to you, that they would not alienate you or retreat from you, but draw closer to you and continue that prayer. And Lord, that they would have a ministry of peace that comes from you, a peace that passes all understanding. Lord, for those that want you to work in their life, I pray, Lord, that we would take our hands off and say, God, this is your will, your way. Lord, help our strength to come from you and that you would work through us. And finally, Lord, I pray that our strength would, re would be renewed. Lord, that our faith and our trust in you would be renewed and that we would continue in our weakness 
to allow you to work through us. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Well, we're going to close in a song. I do believe it is the song that we learned for the special music. So why don't you stand as the worship team comes back up and we're going to sing a new song together.